Welcome to Behavioral Grooves. My name is Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. Behavioral Grooves brings a behavioral science lens to understanding why we do the things we do. Normally, we do that through interesting conversations with world-renowned researchers and practitioners, but today, we are going to do a grooving session with just the two of us. This is going to be so much fun. It's just you and me, Kurt, <laughs> and it always is fun. Okay, Tim, so what are we going to groove on today? Would you mind if we grooved on goals and goal setting? Awesome, of course. And this is an area of your expertise, right? I've got some research background in it, oh, definitely. Right. Yeah. And, and, and you're kind of passionate about it, too. Super passionate about it, yes. So we have a lot to talk about if, we, if, if you're okay with this whole goal thing. I am perfectly... That's a good goal to have. We're going we're gonna to talk about <laughs> goals as our goal to have <laughs> for right. today. All right. So let me start with the question. Help our listeners understand what a goal is and what a goal isn't in the context of of, of work. And because we're kind of going to be talking more about work as opposed to self goals for ourselves and individuals. Is that right? right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's do. Let's okay. Do. Let's so, so help uh, help our listeners understand a little bit about what a goal is and isn't. You know, I like Zig Ziglar's definition. I know it's not Zig Ziglar, the research. Oh wait, no, the motivational speaker. Yeah, yeah. I, I know it's not you know scientific, but when he just talks about a goal is a dream with a deadline. Okay, that's a. I think that's a really great working definition. Okay, so what? Why? Why? Why is a goal or a dream with a deadline a goal? Well, because it's the. There's a couple aspects. Dream it says it's something that's meaningful to me, mm. right? It's it's relevant to me. It's mine. It's not somebody else's. It's mine. I own it. I'm. Con I care about it, right? You know, it's not an objective that was handed down to us. Uh, it's, it's, it's my dream. And then the second part is the deadline part where we say there is, we want to get something, this dream done. We want to get something done in a specific amount of time. And of course, goals don't have to all be about climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, right? They can be just adding bricks to the wall. We can have very small intermediate short-term goals that can still be our dreams in order to accomplish bigger things. But, but all that said, I think a goal being a dream with a deadline encompasses this idea that it's it's mine, it's self-selected, it's meaningful to me, it's relevant to me, and it does live in a world that has deadlines. Okay, but in most organizations that I've worked with, I don't get to pick my goal. My goal is handed to me. Here is your sales goal for the year. Here is your objectives that you need to achieve for whatever time period and that's, it is. So and that's are those what, goals? Well, see, I think that those are objectives. And and it's not going to be your goal until you decide it's your goal, until you really accept it. And that's going to be hard to do unless you had a hand in creating it. All right. So I, I'm going to push back on this because I, I, I'll i go back to the work that Locke and Latham did way back like in the late 60s yeah. and 70s, right? And Groundbreaking they're, they're, work. They're looking at cutting down trees. And you have the trees that they go out and cut as many as you want versus going out and cutting X number of trees. And when they had, when people had X number of trees that they needed to cut in that day, they perform much better than the ones that said, hey, here's your cut as many as you want. And so if I'm to say that my dream, if I'm a tree cutter, I should be able to say, all right, I'm going to cut lots of trees. But it wasn't as productive as when they said cut 10 trees or yeah, whatever it I, was. Well, I think we are talking about the difference between no goal and an assigned goal. And then when you talk about a dream, you're talking about your goal. You're talking about a self-selected goal. A dream is a self-selected goal. That's that's not a no goal situation. That's a self-selected goal. So I would I would frame it as when it just says when when they just say go out and just cut down as many trees as you want, that's a no goal situation. Okay. And then there's the assigned goal where they're saying, here, go and do this many, whether you make it or not. And then the third, which they did not Locke and Latham did not test was just a completely self-selected goal. Okay. Right. And that would be, that's the dream. I think that that's where I say, this is how many I think I can do. And then I make a commitment to it as opposed to just like, kind of, yeah, 
you know, mamby pamby on it. If I make a commitment to that goal, that changes it. Well, okay. So I will go back to Lock and Latham, who are kind of the godfathers they of, are. Of, of this, this they work, right? They are. And some of the components that they talk about making a good goal is that it has to feel achievable. Yes. So you stretch, can, stretch is good. Stretch is good, mm-hmm. but it has to be achievable. Yes. And, but what I'm hearing you say is that that works. It, 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 it drives performance, but to a certain degree, it doesn't drive it as much as if I was to say, here's my stretch goal, and here is that I am now committing to because I chose to, right. to achieve this. Is so, that Right. So uh, modern goal setting theory that, that picked up, that stood on the shoulders of what uh, Gary Latham and Ed Locke created what uh, is involved with people like Klein and uh, Ron Kivitz. And there's a lot of people, George Lonestein's contributing to this. There's a lot of, of more recent literature that stands on the shoulders of what, what Locke and Latham created that includes three kind of key components in, okay. in goal setting theory, right? Achievability. You just talked about this idea of stretch, but achievable. That's the first part. And the second part is being involved in setting the goal. Okay. Some kind of connection to the goal itself. That is an, a really important important part to uh, to the uh, performance uh, or, or what actually gets achieved. And then the last is the relationship between the rewards and the goals, because we want there to be a reward. You know, we, we don't set goals just to achieve things just purely for the sake of achieving them. There needs to be either some kind of intrinsic or in most cases at work, extrinsic rewards. Great. So we have the three components there that are going in. And I know so going back to this component, you have done a lot of work on the self-selected goal component. You yeah. had actually, you know, put together in, in your previous work some specific, you know, methodologies and, and patent processes that yeah. are, are working on that. And I know there's been some recent research on, on that uh, that was done by Bamaraju and, and Honeberg. Is that right? Oh, yeah, so yeah. The, yeah. The component where they actually looked at this. And I found this research interesting and fascinating, you know, the, the self-selected sales incentives, um, evidence of their effectiveness. And so do you want to, can you talk a little bit about that research? Yeah, I actually uh, partnered up with Raghu uh, Bamaraju on on that. He was uh, getting his PhD at the University of Houston with Mike Ahern, and we we connected on this. And so he used uh, some of the data. But his, uh, to get back to, to the work that he was doing was to try to under, trying to piece out how important the self-selection aspect of the goal was to uh, to the success, and what Raghu and Steven Honberg, uh, you know, discovered in their analysis was this tremendous, uh, tremendous impact that the people who self selected their goals performed significantly better than than those who were assigned their goals. Right, and in the in there they had this component where they looked at four different levels of goals based upon prior performance, and people got to select, and if they selected a goal that was at a level A. And they didn't achieve level A, they got nothing in level, you know, they could set level B, but they had rewards that were commensurate with that. But then they also assigned people those same goals based upon some of that work. And when they did that, what they found was that, wow, those sales actually really, it was a sales component. Yeah, and it was. They, they sales went way up when they had the self-selection, even when everything else was was paired up. And so they had that control group, which was really nice. Well, and this gets back to self-identity. You know, I, I love, you always bring up the, you don't always, but you, you talk about a great example of what it was like to be at a trade show and have a bike with uh, with a, a very modest prize. Mm-hmm. Just just churn the bike fast enough, just pedal the wheels fast enough so that you bring one light up on a, on a scale of a, a bunch of lights. But people didn't stop there. Right. So actually, when you give them an opportunity to to exhibit their uh, their expertise or their prowess or their ability that th- oftentimes they're just willing to go for it and and what our research found is that people when given the opportunity to select their own goal oftentimes went for the most aggressive goal Almost- more so than if it would have if a manager would have said oh i'm going to assign you level b instead of level c which was the higher goal they would pick level c because they felt like they could go for it and get that's it that's right and they also were more likely to achieve at that goal, at, at that more aggressive level, because it was self-selected. That had something to do with. And getting back to this, this goal reward arrangement, a key part of this is that the goals, uh, as they got more aggressive, 
because there was more risk involved, the rewards were more generous, okay. significantly more generous. So when you work with companies around this, how, what, what do you do? How, how do you help companies around their goals and goal selection and various different things? What kind of work do you do with companies? So the first thing to do is, is to assess this, the current situation. Try to understand what they're doing, what's working, and what's not. You know, Obviously, the reason that you and I get called in is, is because something in the organization isn't working perfectly. So let's try to understand what is working and, and, and what's not. Um, and then we, we look at how are the goals being assigned right now? How are they being created? What's the process that they're using? And then try to work with, uh, with developing a plan that integrates um, a collaboration, in a more collaborative environment so that, so that people who are making the goals uh, can also be working closely with the people who are actually executing the goals. Right. Right. Yeah. So I know we did some work together with a large pharmaceutical company yeah. and we are one the, the largest issue with this Salesforce, there was a smaller Salesforce within this larger company yeah, that just, was huge, but, but it was still a, a significant division, still a significant division, but they had this feeling that the goals were just a unattainable, yeah. that they did not have any reflection of the, of the reality on the ground and in the various different territories. And as we were working with them, that was the biggest issue. And we had to work with people inside the organization who felt like they knew better than the people on the ground. In, in large part, because they were sort of blinded by the data. Because they said the data says they could achieve X and, yeah. and this is where it's going. And yet the people on the ground did not believe that. And there's there's truth in both of those aspects, but right. it was this. But, they, but the, the problem was there was no collaboration. It was a one-sided assignment of goals rather than allowing the discussion to happen to, to sort of suss out this idea of where, right. where could the goals be reasonable stretch but achievable right and so we came in and we worked with them and we did a number of focus groups with with people from around the country we brought those components back we got we, we had people, individual interviews we talked to leadership we talked we got people talking together which seems like oh that should happen all the time but <laughs> right but it doesn't and then sometimes i think and then we also helped in saying how do you craft these these goals knowing that you can't have everybody at least in this situation they weren't they weren't willing to go to the component where everybody could you know choose their own goal right. so but how do you craft these goals so that there is this feeling like they have input in various different things and so how do you do that and structurally and and various different things and i think it was it was a very successful component they it, still talk about you know the the program with a little <laughs> weird name well what it's one of the things that i remember so vividly was how we talked to top performers and we talked to sort of mid-level and lower performers all of them had some complaint about the way the goals were being set. Yes. It, it wasn't as if it were just the low performers that were griping like, what are you doing to me? But the top performers were saying, you're asking too much of us. We are already at our max ability and, and we're maxing out our territory. And you're still saying we have to grow beyond our ability to actually do it. Right. So that they did not perceive any sense of achievability in them. And I will tell you, the number one complaint when I work with sales forces around incentives and their, their annual incentive plans, right? The number one complaint we get from the field is always that the goals are not appropriate. Yeah. To your degree, it, it is not just those those bottom performers that are complaining about the goals. It is the top performers as well. The ones who still achieve and go above the goal typically are, are also complaining. And there's a variety of reasons around that. And it gets back into, A, to your point, how involved are they on that? But B, how well do they understand how the goals are set? Because again, it comes back down to, Sometimes these goals are just handed down by corporate and they don't understand all of the components that went into how they were developed, what were the what were the different factors that came into play here and there and why that matters and why they're expected to have a growth of 10% and in the neighboring territory only has a growth of 5%. And there's this fairness component. There's all these different factors that come into play. And those are key aspects to get people to buy in to say that, yes, this is my dream as well, and not just the company's dream. We have a, a, a global telecommunications customer that we're both working with uh, right now 
and our, our one of our chief contacts is a huge evangelist of, of this idea of self-selected goals, right? And, um, and it just got me thinking about there are a lot of people who are just uneducated about the value of self-selected goals. So, Kurt, what do you think are the main myths or what are the, what are the problems that they see when it comes to, to self-selected goals um, that is preventing uh, companies from using su- such, uh, such a model? I think there's a, there's a couple. One is just this myth that because if you give somebody an uh, uh, opportunity to self-select their goal, they're going to pick the easiest goal. And you've yeah, already, right. you know, to a certain point, demystified that. And you can set up structures so that it's less likely to happen. You can tie the reward into how how big of a goal that they pick, right? And usually it's a, above some baseline, various different pieces right. of, of the way that that works. Now, myth number two, from my perspective, is they're thinking about, oh, how are we operationally going to be able to right. implement it? You can't, that's just crazy, you know? It's, it's much easier if we just push those goals down. We already have 19 different comp plans. It's too complicated. And and, yeah. and the fact of the matter is, is that you can. You can go down it's and possible. you can give people an opportunity. And, and it's not saying that you give them free reign to pick whatever goal they want. You have certain strategic initiatives and plans that the organization has. And so how do you align the ability for them to choose within a certain set of of choices or parameters that still drives those corporate strategies and initiatives, but yet gives enough autonomy and enough freedom that they can go, yes, here is here is what I think is achievable. It's a little bit stretch. I own this. I'm committed to it, and gets there. What else? What What else? I, are, I think another missing? well, another big myth is that um, I, I, we can do it. You know, uh, we we corporate can uh, and management can assign goals that are that are just perfect because we've got all the data. We know what everybody's run rate is. We know what the size of the markets are. We've got the data, but they're missing out on the psychological grip that you get when someone self-selects the goal. Yeah. It's a it's a big big miss. All right, all right. So with that, I think to summarize, goals are really important. Goals are really about making sure that we take uh, a personal component that they become real to the individual, that they're their own dreams and not something that is just pushed down upon them to have their greatest impact. Not saying that, you know, goals themselves, just having a stretch goal out there, as long as people feel it's achievable, right? Yeah. Um, that there's this element, you had mentioned three things, I've already forgotten what they well, were. Well, you started down achievability, right? right. We need to perceive it as achievable, but with some stretch, because stretch works. Uh, the second one then is involvement, that right. that, that collaboration. Uh, it, it's, it's not that you're going to just let everybody run off and set their own goals willy-nilly. It's about collaborating with the corporate goals and what uh, objectives that need to be obtained. And then last is then to make sure that the, we didn't talk much about this, but the idea that the rewards need to be commensurate with the effort and the risk involved in achieving the goals. And the risk. I think that's a really good piece because there is a risk of the amount of effort and time and energy that I put into it. And if that reward isn't commensurate with that uh, extra effort, yeah. then you know it comes down into the with them, right? What, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? And so there's a psychological component that drives that motivation around that and various different pieces. So I think all three of those things are really important. I think then the aspect of saying organizations miss on this a lot of times because they feel like they have the expertise to be able to do it themselves. They feel that people are going to slack and that just the operational component of trying to to do it is just overburdensome. So if people have questions about this, uh, you know, so have give them us call a call. You? Absolutely. Well, both of us. My gosh, we both we absolutely both do work in the in this realm, and of course, our our emails are on the, on the in the show notes. So uh, click on us and, and contact us. We'd love to have a conversation about this. And so you know, let us know. We'd love to because we're always trying to. Uh, you know, obviously help people, but we're also looking for these in- information pieces that we can bring back into the this, this show and tell people about, hey, here's here's some cool stuff that we just found out. So if yes. you have a really, really good challenge, we want to hear about it. We do. We All do. Right. Thanks for listening. Thanks a lot.